Hello and welcome to the Unshackled Waves, episode 10. And you're here with your editors in chief, Tim Wilms. Hi, Tim. Hello. And Sukith Fernando, that's me. And it's our Thursday interview show where we um, interview people who are doing their bit to fight their battles against the enemies of freedom. Um, you know, just casually fighting the enemies. And we're lucky to have our first international guest today, um, all the way from Michigan, America. Um, it's YouTuber Joe from the channel Priority Pod. Hi, Joe. Uh, hello. Hi. Um, well, it's 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 an it's a great um honor for um to have you because you know it's your our first international guest. Um, so, what is your work background, and you know how did you actually arrive at your current political beliefs, and how do you describe them? Um, my work background is honestly sitting around looking for work. Uh, <laughs> the economy wasn't great for me. Um, how I arrived at my political beliefs? Well, I was raised in a pretty conservative area. Um, I've always been just a conservative dude. Yeah. Uh, I think I was one of the few lucky people who never started out as a leftist and then switched over. Yeah, that's, that's true. I mean, that, that, that is lucky. Um, and I heard that you were from Texas originally. Uh, I'm from Michigan originally. So oh, okay. From Texas. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so you're conservative. Do you have any... Because in your YouTube channel, you say you're a bit libertarian as well. Is that true? Yeah, mostly on the social issues. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not very much of a social conservative. Okay. Economically very conservative. Okay, that's good. Yeah, I mean that's important to be economically conservative. Um, so, who do you support in America, and which party do you generally support um, in in the in voting? Uh, generally, I go with the Republican Party. Okay. Um, yeah. There okay. aren't all that many options. True. I mean, we will get to the election soon. So you wouldn't describe yourself as sort of uh, uh, as a sort of uh, new Republican, or, or no, well, as it's termed, like alt right. You're sort of more a, a traditionalist, uh, conservative, conservative, libertarian, or constitutional conservative. Uh, yeah, probably best with constitutional conservative. I was never all that big on Trump. I mean, he's here now, and he was the better of the two options, but I never loved him all that much. So, Joe, sorry, Tim. Joe, can you explain to our, uh, to our um, listeners the big difference between constitutional conservative and libertarian conservative? Because I don't think, because we are mainly an Australian um, channel, so I don't think many people understand the constitutional versus libertarian thing. Uh, constitutional conservatism is uh, mostly about establishing our government on the basis of our constitution and the uh, rights and duties of government and the people uh, laid out therein. Um, libertarians are a bit more, um, we need to shrink it, but not necessarily based on the constitution, whereas we want to shrink it uh, based on where the constitution says it should be. Okay, okay. So we've, we've talked about a bit of your political background. We'll, we'll now start uh, talking about your, your YouTube channel, which is better described as uh, anti-SJW, anti-left anti channel. Yeah. Started out more anti-left, became more anti-SJW with time. Well, they're the ones that have become the most you know, prominent leftists in recent years. Right. Uh, so uh, had a... Uh, what sort of motivated you to, to start creating videos and your YouTube channel? Uh, at the time, I just saw, you know, a couple of YouTubers talking about this stuff. And uh, I had been living in Germany when all this really got big, so I didn't even hear about it. And I come back and I see, no, this is, like, actually happening. I, I want to have my say in this. And so I started making YouTube videos about it. Okay, so you moved from Germany to America. Uh, yeah. I okay. Over there in the army for a couple. Of years. Oh, okay. So you heard about what's happening in America when you were in Germany, and how did you how did you hear about that? Uh, I I didn't really hear about it until I got back. It was okay. Kind of an isolated bubble of Americans who all been over there for several years. Okay. I really knew what was going on until we got back. Oh, okay. And you were surprised. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
Well, the, the, the thing is, so like, you said you were anti left first, but now you're anti SGW. Can you explain that more? So you're not anti. So are you anti left now? Uh, yeah, I'm still anti left. Okay. Um, but I, I kind of started out, my, my main target originally were like Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. Yeah. My main targets now are the uh, uh, I Need Rights is non binary demi kit, you know? Right, okay, yeah. Because. I go yeah. after Hillary and Bernie once in a while. Yeah, because yeah, because the election is over anyway. So I mean, I, I get it. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, it's, fair to, it's probably fair to say that uh, you know, uh, I hate to say it, but you know, Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders are slightly, uh, you know, their uh, their politics are slightly more reasoned than some of the the stuff that SJWs come up with. Yeah, at least the uh, I mean, Bernie Sanders managed to present socialism as a great idea. Um, that's something that SJWs can never do. I mean, they basically convince people by sheer numbers. Uh, Sanders at least managed to make a convincing argument for a terrible system. Yeah, that, that was always my, my opinion of him. But I, did, I, you know, I didn't agree with his solutions, but he, you know, made made his argument quite well. Yeah. As for Hillary, do you, um, you know, m many people accuse her of sort of being quite, well, being a socialist. But the thing is, when you look at her, she doesn't really seem very socialist. She does seem quite capitalist in a sense. Um, but the thing is, you have, you've had sort of first-hand experience seeing her there. Um, what do you think about her? Is she really a socialist, do you think? Or, um, because I've seen many people say that she's actually more right-wing than Theresa May in Britain, for example. Um, and she's the Prime Minister there for the Conservatives. Um, so do you think Hillary is socialist, or do you think she's still quite capitalist? Uh, I, I don't think she's a socialist. I think, okay. uh, especially now that we've seen Bernie Sanders run, we know what actual socialist looks like in America. Okay. Um, but I wouldn't describe her as a capitalist either. I'd say the closest thing for her really would be like a neocon. Uh, she's basically the left-wing equivalent, but very corporatist. Um, not necessarily pro free market, but pro big business. Okay, so more. I think that's what people didn't like about her. So more crony capitalism. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so the thing is, um, are you happy with the reception of your videos and with the growth of your channel? So how have you how have you found um, your reception to be like? Uh, a lot better now than it used to be. Uh, when I started out, I was mostly getting a lot of hate from. Bernie Sanders supporters. Okay. Or not being a diehard socialist. And, well, now that I've kind of found a niche with uh, anti SJWs, uh, people seem to like it a lot more. Um, once in a while I'll bring up Sanders and then I still get some angry comments. So uh, somehow the biggest SJW of a candidate kind of has anti SJW supporters. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, in your channel, you actually say there's a part that says, um, you know, if you want me dead, just call this number or something. Or just press this link or something. So I think that's the response to your, um, to the SJWs, I think. Yeah, yeah. The Discord server that I have now, and it's you know mostly filled with fans of mine at this point. But when I originally made it, I wanted those Sanders supporters to come in and have you know a verbal conversation. Yeah. And none of them ever took me up on it. But I, I put it there for them, and I just haven't changed the title on it. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah our uh, website and our podcast have been going for a couple of months now, and so, yeah, we've, uh, we're, we're receiving good feedback and, you know, obviously, you know, negative feedback, so, uh, yeah, we sort of know, know, know what that's like a bit. Yeah. Uh, especially when you start out, you seem to find the people who hate you the most first, and then eventually people who like your views find you. Yeah, but as you know, unlike uh, s uh, some people, we don't get you know triggered by you know some of the mean comments that are there. Yeah, I mean we get called fake news sometimes. I embrace the mean comments. I prefer them because they give me something to do with my day. Uh, always, if they call you you know a racist or whatever, you know you haven't got much. Yeah, those are the ones who usually I'll say, okay, we'll show how I'm a racist then. Suddenly they disappear. Sukuth has got the the ultimate weapon in in those sort of arguments since he isn't white. Yeah. 
Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, they can't accuse me of being racist because the thing is, if I used their logic, then accusing me of racist is racist itself. If I use their logic, so they can't really use it against me. <laughs> yes, yeah, they do have. I was simulated. <laughs> Yeah, they used that against me. I, I was simulated, so therefore, you know, I've changed. Yes, yeah, yeah, there's that now. Yeah, that, the Tumblr arguments. <laughs> um, so, yeah, with your, uh, a lot of your videos are responding to uh, anti-SJW uh, videos. I noticed a few of your favourite targets are uh, um, uh, uh, the person who's now called Riley Dennis. Even <laughs> Dennis, and... And uh, Milo Stewart. I mean, they. Uh, uh, well, a lot of what they come up with is pretty terrible. So uh, it's 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 quite easy to to respond to their videos. It's there, there's quite a lot of um, as they're called anti SJW roasting uh, roasting channels. I mean, obviously there's Undoomed, uh, Sargon, uh, Sargon of Arcade. Um, do you think that there's sort of uh, there's the potential for those sort of videos to become uh, oversaturated on YouTube, or do you think that um, the fact that there are so many of these videos is just a sign that you know there is this huge movement against um, uh, against social justice warriors, political correctness, and and progressivism? Right. See, I, I think the more there are, the better, because the SJW's main movement up until now has been uh, oh, we have the sheer numbers. Uh, everyone is on our side, so if you're against us, uh, shut up because we own you. And so the more people come out and speak out against it, um, the less they have that power. The more we can see there is actually a divide here. There are two sides to this argument. So do you think, um, because they use the argument that they have the numbers, do you actually think they do have the numbers? No. Uh, I think there's a, a huge silent majority. Yeah. Who just kind of puts up with their shit? Yeah, uh, I, I, and I think there's uh, I think there's an equal sized group who both um, on their side and against them, and I think most people just don't care, so they just go with whatever's not going to get them into an argument. I do notice that uh, on Milo Stewart's videos that she gets more thumbs down and more negative comments than than she does uh, positive. So it's clearly that, um, yeah, the, 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 inter the internet is certainly indicating that, um, yeah, there, there certainly is a lot of people that, have, you know, don't agree with that. Yeah, there's a lot of, uh, and there's kind of the revengeful thing. We've kind of been backed into the corner and told to shut up all this time. So we are kind of fighting back fiercely. Yeah, I think that's a good argument because, you know, political correctness has been, like, pushed around for so long that it's um, sort of backfired because now we have people um, who are going against political correctness and just, you know, saying things because they're, because they're trolling and because they just want to re rebel against political correctness. Right, and I kind of even see that with the uh, Trump victory. Yeah, yeah. People who definitely would have voted, like, liberal Democrats see this has gone too far. Yeah. We can't just go around calling every single white person racist. We can't just go around calling every man sexist. Um, and normally I would have supported Hillary because I agree more with their policies, but um, I'm going to vote for Trump because he's the one who's against these people. This is off the right people. Yeah, I mean, we... Yeah, and that's ultimately oh. why I wound up voting for him, even though I do still agree with him more than Hillary. Yeah, the thing is, like, we had... Um, because we had, like, Islamic women who actually voted for Trump, uh, who, who came out saying, you know, we voted for Trump simply because of this political correctness. Um, you know, we have people who are saying we are progressives, but we voted for Trump because of his anti-PC um, sort of attitude. So that's, that's, that's a good thing, I think. Yeah, well, they've kind of alienated anyone to the right of Stalin as, as <laughs> hard right-wing. Yeah. So why not? I'm going to vote for the right this time. Uh, because I want to reclaim my portion of the left, and it's a legitimate one. Well, Trump certainly brought together this broad coalition of, of people who don't normally uh, uh, vote Republican. I mean, just here in Australia, I uh, I ran into uh, potheads who had Make America Great Again caps. Um, in, uh, uh, people 
uh, for, you know, people who, for, you know, for internet freedom, uh, they, they were wearing Make America Great Again caps. So there were, there were definitely people who, you know, you would probably consider uh, from the left wing who were, you know, pro-Trump this election. Yeah, it's a lot like that, uh, the situation with Brexit, where who really swung it were the uh, disenfranchised labor voters. And even though labor was very against it, um, they said, we're still going to vote labor next year, but we're not, um, we need this. Uh, I think we've seen a lot of that is people who've just been pushed um, out of their own group. And so they've just kind of gone to the other side because they're the only other group out there. Yeah, um, because, I mean, that's that's a good point, because we actually had a discussion about this in our previous podcast, where we talked about how um, there are people who usually vote for left-wing parties, um, who actually voted for right-wing parties parties this time, or they voted for something something right-wing. So, for example, um, you know, as you said, in Brexit, in Britain, you know, we had people who voted for Brexit, but they are left-wing. But Brexit sounds more like a right-wing thing. Um, and we had, um, in America, of course, we had Trump um, winning, but we had people in left-wing areas, le- main, major Democrat states, who voted for Trump, and they, they went for Trump. So, it's, um, I think it just shows that people are getting fed up with the left in general. Yeah. Voted red in my lifetime. Exactly. Yeah. Where they are all voting red in one election, and these are, you know, major blue states. Um, they're democratic strongholds. They're um, a lot less white. They're a lot poorer. They're the working class, and these are the states where the Democrats normally, like, win by default. Yeah, and they voted for Trump. But the thing is, if Sanders, if Bernie Sanders was the Democrat um, nominee. Do you think they would have voted for Bernie Sanders over Trump? Uh, I'm not sure on that one, because uh, Sanders never really got the spotlight, and that was both his uh, detriment and probably what made him so popular. Um, If people were actually, if the majority of America actually got the chance to look at his policies, I'm not sure how they would feel about them. I would think he would have been a little bit less popular than he was in the primaries. Um, Okay. Really his diehard supporters knowing who he was. But, uh, yeah, I'm certainly of the opinion, though, that Sanders would have been able to better appeal to, you know, working-class people in, in Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Ohio better than than, than Hillary would have. And but I know we shouldn't talk about polling anymore, but all the polls consistently showed that Sanders always did beat all the Republican uh, candidates, uh, and Hillary didn't. Right. But, uh, again, like you said, we've seen just how worthless our polls are. Uh, yeah. Hillary was, what, 98% projected winner by the end of the night, and she lost miserably. Uh, everyone had her winning. I, I ran a simulator that said, um, here are the possible combinations that could give either side a win um, based on polling. And I ran, like, 30 of them, and zero of them came out with a Trump win. I needed to run, like, 150 to get a Trump win out of them. And I never got a Trump win out of them. And then Trump wins anyways. Not the popular vote, mind you, but the vote that counts. Uh, so yeah, obviously we've been we've been talking uh, talking about it quite a bit so far. But yeah, Trump Trump winning the election has sort of been uh, the bi- the big event uh, of the past month. So yeah, obviously. And obviously. Uh, in the next few years, like obviously Trump's, you know, not a, uh, not a conservative. But what do you sort of think that uh, that a Trump presidency, what effect that will have? Um, let's see. The, the effect of the presidency for Trump probably um, we're going to see a lot more SJW rage, and I think when uh, Trump doesn't wind up locking up every minority in a concentration camp and putting them in the oven, that uh, they're going to look even crazier. Uh, that'll bring more support to our side. Unfortunately, I think it's going to bring a lot of the support to the alt-right, which is claiming all the credit for Trump, even though it's a very small group of people. Um, So I don't think it's going to bring much support to, you know, actual mainstream conservatism, but uh, at least it'll bring it away from the left. Yeah, sort of like the... the uh, I've noticed that nobody actually, actually calls themselves... 
uh, you know, mainstream person calls themselves alt-right, and given that we saw that that footage from uh, what's it called, the the National Policy Institute uh, conference yeah, the yeah. other day, where they oh, that was just like, uh, you know, terrible. Um, yeah, but you know, obviously, um, you know that that gives the left the perfect. Um, example to say, see, this is what Trump's creating, but, you know, I don't have, but, I think most... But to be fair, that rally only had about as many people as a Hillary rally, so it's not super relevant. But, yeah, yeah it, it's, they're getting a lot of credit for Trump, and Trump is kind of letting them have it, and I don't think that's good, but I think we can fix that later as long as we can get people to realize just how crazy the left is, I think we can uh, eventually kick out the alt-right. Yeah, because mo most of, you know, tr uh, tr Trump support, you know, didn't come from that fringe, you know, uh, alt-right. Alt it came from, you know, just, just ordinary people who, yeah, they were, you know, uh, they were certainly, um, you know, they were worried about uh, jobs, uh, the economy, but they were also, you know, annoyed about um, polit political correctness and this identity politics that... Obama had sort of fostered with Black Lives Matter and, of course, the you know, ridiculous protests at the at, at the university. So I think so I think that you know, his support, you know, is you know do, uh, does come you know from the mainstream and is not sort of this from this fringe uh, alt right. So yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't think that you know the alt right is going to be empowered, but certainly ordinary people are going to be empowered just to stand up to the left craziness right yeah and I, I don't think the the alt-right is ever going to be a huge deal but I, I worry that they might siphon enough off the mainstream and people might start to look at the alt-right more seriously I mean I, I have friends in the alt-right and most of them are not crazy racist but um, I, I just don't want to go in that direction because they don't really care about what mainstream conservatism does which is you know again adhering to our Constitution that's what most um, that's what built the Republican Party. And the neocons never cared about that. And the alt-right is kind of a different neocon. It's the inverse of neocons. With basically the same thing. It's kind of like fascists and communists. They're the same thing, but on opposite ends. Yeah. Um, so, Joe, um, can you tell us how you think the left and SJWs can actually be stopped. Like, how can we stop them from, you know, well, first of all, how can we, how can we make sure that they sort of learn everything and sort of face reality? And second, how can we stop them from spreading all these um, lies about leftism and just trying to brainwash people into supporting it? Um, I, I think the way that we stop it is we, uh, we let them grow up. We tell them to go out and get jobs. A day in the real world, you're never going to survive as an SJW. You're going to realize that there are mean people, there are nice people, and if you just get triggered at everything people say, you're never going to make it anywhere. Um, uh, on top of that, I think we just need to show that there is that silent majority and you know, even our vocal minority that is opposed to them. The thing is... not in favor of their ideas. And, yeah. Uh, again, their whole merit of their ideas is they're supposedly popular, so more we show that not to be the case, okay. the weaker they get. Okay, yeah. Well, the thing is, I mean, they have this thing where I feel like they don't really care that even, even the majority is still sort of right-wing. For example, like, I feel like they just, um, they're sort of immune to that um, because they sort of don't care about the majority. They, they, they're like, you know, well, we know better than you. You know, we're university educated people. We know better, you know. So do you think it's enough to just um, make sure, just make sure that they actually go into the real world and go from there, or because I feel like we need to do more. No, my main concern is keeping them out of power. Uh, I don't okay. think they eradicate the ideas entirely. It's kind of like the KKK. I mean, they used to be very mainstream. They used to have a lot of power. I mean, they still exist now, but they can't yeah. do anything because there's only like eight thousand members. Um, okay. Deal with them. We're never going to get rid of the ideas they have altogether. 
but we can push them to the fringes. Yeah, I mean, we will never get rid of get rid of it, and like, um, you know, it's if we do try and get rid of it, we'll make it worse anyway, because they'll just sort of sort of um, it'll backfire. Um, but I get I get what you mean with the KKK, because um, you know they, they were there for a while, but they're not there anymore, and it feels like nature took care of them. But when it comes to things like feminism and LGBT issues, um, what do you think? What do you think about that? Like, how can we respond to that? Um, those sorts, sorts of things. Um, feminism. Uh, I think we just need to keep shoving facts in their face. Um, show the wage gap is false. Um, show that the idea of rape culture on college campuses is false. Um, just keep showing everybody that they're wrong. And again, that'll push people, push them to the fringes because. How many people want to believe something that can be proven wrong? Um, Did you go to university? Uh, I spent a semester in college, and then I moved. Oh, so. So, uh, so you know a bit of a bit of what it's like. Yeah. Well, it was college down in Texas, so it wasn't too bad. But <laughs> yeah. We did have a, a instructor there who was a little bit on the feminist side. Okay. Universities in Australia are not much better. Uh, Sukas is in university at the moment. Yeah, um, here I think um, I don't think it's as as bad as as some in America. But yes, we do have that. We do have the um, socialist alternative. Looking at it from the outside, I would honestly say that Australia looks like it's worse because okay. down there it seems like it's gotten into the primary school system as well. True. Yes. Um, yes. That, that's a good point. That's a good point because. Um, in Victoria, that there there are problems with primary schools where they're trying to sort of um, teach kids that there's a thing called white privilege and how to spot white privilege, how to spot racism, all that. Um, you know, yeah, <laughs> it's and then there's, uh, like we have individual uh, schools doing that, but we don't have anything like you know the state board of education declaring this thing like that. It seems oh, like yeah. it stepped up a level down there. Yeah. Edu- yeah, education in Australia, it's it's, yeah, it's the curriculum set, set by the state government. So, yeah, Sukhith so mentioned the, uh, yeah, the anti-racism program. That's, that's, that's from the federal government, so that... Yeah, yeah, the, yeah that's federal. Uh, oh, that's uh, where, where, where I live in Victoria, they've introduced uh, yeah, what they call it respectful relationships, which is a, a pro-feminism uh, uh, education program that teaches about male privilege and... Uh, advocates uh, affirmative action. Yeah. See, you seem to have... Uh, they seem to have gained power further up, but they don't seem to be pushing as radical ideas, I guess. Because here, you know, when they push these ideas, they're, uh, um, we're going to take the black kids and the white kids and teach them separately three days a week so they understand, you know, what it's like to be black. Weird stuff like that. Um, which harkens back to the 50s and 60s. Yeah. Times for race relations. Yeah. <laughs> but, again, this is like individual schools doing this, and as soon as it happens, I mean, everyone freaks out and says, what are you doing? This is insane. I, th- I think it's uh, it's easier in America to protect against that sort of thing because you do have decentralization of power, where in Australia there is this tendency for uh, all the sort of power to make laws and regulations is centered on state governments and federal, uh, federal governments. So we're sort of more susceptible to the left infiltrating it. Right, and that's part of the reason I like the way our constitution is and why I think we should bring our government back that way is it keeps power decentralized. So even if you know one side can take over you know, a huge section, they can only control that section. They can't control everything from there. So you said you're a conservative. Yeah. Um, what's your view on gay marriage, for example? Uh, honestly, I don't care that much about it. My okay. Is the fact that it was the Supreme Court that legalized it. Um, okay. I, I would prefer that it be done by a state legislature or uh, just get the government out of marriage altogether. It would be my strongest preference. But yeah, yeah, I would. She was the Supreme Court doing it. Yeah, I would like. Um, I would like deregulation as well, but I am against same-sex marriage. But Tim um, would also prefer deregulation, right, Tim? Yeah, that's what I ultimately. Yeah. Like. But yeah, I agree that in, a, or in America that it's a it's a state issue. Yeah. And it should be up to you know individual states, and yeah, obviously like the 
uh, the big freak out by the left is, oh, you know, same-sex marriage could be overturned by the Supreme Court. Well, you know, if, like, it, it, well, if what, you, you legalize you know, it just, by the Supreme Court, then? Yeah, like, wouldn't they it have been... They got lazy legalizing better? it, figuring they'd be in power forever, and then, well, they'll, they're making it very easy to overturn it. I kind of pointed that out in my last video, is... Uh, there's a reason you should do things the constitutional way, because when you do things the proper way, um, state by state or even federal legislature, it's very hard to undo. Um, but when you just kind of get lazy and cheat, uh, it's very easy to change your mind. I mean, the Supreme Court can make another ruling tomorrow and completely reverse gay marriage. Whereas if they yeah, did it our it way, seems that they, they would have to go state by state and have each state um, reverse it, which would be more difficult. It takes longer to do it in the first place, but it takes longer to get rid of it, too. Yeah, and sort of with the left, they, they sort of don't care about sort of whether the process is, you know, democratic. They, it's just for them the the ends justifies the means. So, you know, if even if we disenfranchise, you know, like hun hundreds of millions of Americans, like, as long as we get what we want, that's fine. Right. Well, I, I'm not big on democracy either. I'm a big fan of the concept of republic, but, um, but for them it's... It doesn't matter if we do things the correct way. It's as long as we get them done. It doesn't matter how we did it. You know, um, I don't care that, um, say, Obama is doing something that should be up to the legislature. Well, the president doesn't have that power, but the legislature won't do it, so he's just going to do it anyways. Um, and they don't mind that. And I say that's a big problem. That is something that is for the legislature. Why is the president doing it? So, uh, so we've uh, discussed uh, obviously the how YouTube, uh, YouTube is uh, uh, was uh, was a forum where a lot of um, Trump supporters uh, uh, got together, and uh, obviously key to Trump's victory was a lot of the new media. So obviously Facebook and websites such as uh, Breitbart. Uh, and info wars and even though the whole of the, the mainstream media was you know for Hillary and all the, and they, all their polls suggested that Hillary was going to win do you think that uh, the mainstream media is uh, is on the decline and that new media is the way of the future oh yeah it, the mainstream media has been on the decline for uh, probably since 2004 uh, no one pays attention to CNN Fox MSNBC um, you get your news online because uh, online, you know who your news source is, you know their spin, and you can look at multiple sources at the same time. So you can kind of say, oh, okay, here's this article from, say, CNN um, online, and you can compare it to, okay, well, what's Fox saying about it? And usually whatever the overlap is, you can ascertain is the actual information. Um, but then you can go to, you know, any number of websites. Now, there's a danger to that where you can get inaccurate information because they don't have any integrity, but the media has proven with this election that they have none, too. So uh, what's the difference between getting an article from CNN and Blogspot at this point? And... Yeah, I love how... Yeah. That, oh, that's fine, Tim. Yeah. That, yeah. The, uh, the, the uh, mainstream media, they're blaming, blaming fake news for Trump's victory. Like, <laughs> uh, obviously, because they've... Uh, you know, obviously lost influence, and so their response is, oh, but all that new media, it's fake, which means that it's news we disagree with. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the new media has at least some level of accountability. Um, that I think YouTube is a more viable platform, honestly, than um, articles are. Um, like YouTube podcasts, uh, I think people enjoy the um, more interactive content. Um and I think you get more accurate information that way, too, because there's a little bit more accountability when you put your name and your voice to it versus um, writing it down in text. Uh, I think it's a lot harder to ignore when people say, hey, you're wrong about this, and you actually have to go back and correct yourself. And do you plan on doing this um, in the future as well? Like, do you plan on doing this full time? Uh, yeah, I'm just going to keep doing it as long as I have time to. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I noticed vanishes, that you vanishes and we live in utopia. But <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, so I noticed that you've uh, you know got a, a Patreon account, so you certainly want to yeah be able to you know do this more. Yeah. Um, 
my goal is to be able to do this full time, but I plan to do most of the funding on that myself. Is basically uh, when I can pick up a more full time job and then do most of the funding myself, and hopefully I can get some contributions from fans to assist. But you know that's up to them. But at the moment, I'm basically taking a loss on this. Just fund it all through my own means. Yeah, um, so we've talked a bit about the, the differences between Australia and the United States, but uh, a lot of what we get told by the media and commentators in Australia about the United States is, is, is the United States is an example of what you get when you have, you know, capitalism, uh, free speech and guns gone wild. Um, and so, you know, we don't want to turn into America is what they always say. Um, but we just want to know what it's, you know, really like. Is there, you know, homeless people everywhere? Is there, you know, heaps of, you know, poor people not being able to afford things? And, you know, do you worry about um, when you go to the shops, there might be a mass shooting, mass shooting there? Uh, the one issue they may have a fair bet on is uh, homelessness. Um, as far as, like, yeah. mass shootings, I, I don't go to a mall and think, hey, I'm going to get shot or anything like that. Um, I, I feel pretty safe in America. Now, again, um, there are areas where I wouldn't feel as safe, like Chicago, L.A., New York City, um, because they have a lot of crime, but those three cities make up probably 75% of our murders. Um, so if you avoid wow, those areas, it's uh, pretty close. They're also 75% of the population, but um, those cities make it way disproportionate on how dangerous it is to be in America. Like, yeah, we do get the occasional mass shooting, but uh, when you consider the population of the country and how big it is, we're not that bad off. We're still one of the more relatively safe countries on the planet to live in, and uh, we're freer for it. Uh, we had um, one of our former uh, deputy prime ministers who said in response to um, one mass shooting recently that there should be travel warnings to uh, to, uh, to the United States because of all the, the shootings and uh, he would advise Australians not to go there. Oh, where was the mass shooting? Um, I can't remember. It was uh, it was a while back. It, it, that was just his response to, to one of them. Okay. I, I'm just thinking because the last few um, mass shootings I can think of were all terrorist attacks, but um, even no, though they're they mass shootings, they out. had... They, yeah, they had nothing to do with uh, Islam. They were just mass shootings caused by yeah, guns. So it would have been one of the ones before San Bernardino. Uh, either way, it's, uh, again, when you look at the uh, actual per capita statistics, it's not that dangerous here. Um, generally, uh, again, it, it's the big cities that are dangerous. But I think no matter where you go in the world, the big cities are kind of dangerous. Um, <laughs> but everywhere else you feel pretty safe. I mean, I don't walk down the street and think, oh, who's going to shoot me or anything like that. Um, I'm not terrified if a street light is out that someone's going to come over and rob me or anything. Uh, we're pretty safe here. And the thing is, do New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles have more strict gun control laws than other areas? Uh, yes. Um, quite strict. Yeah. So... I mean, I've seen graphs where they say that um, there's a correlation between the level of gun control and the level of um, gun violence, and it seems and it seems like the more gun control there is, the more gun violence there is. Uh, yeah, or at least the most over the more uh, overall violence. Yeah, um, yeah. Even like uh, I've looked at the stats in Australia, and um, like when you guys passed your uh, gun ban or whatever it was, the uh, trade in. Program. Yeah. <laughs> um, gun buybacks. Yeah. yeah, the gun buyback. Um, from when you guys started doing that, um, gun violence dropped like a rock, but murder stayed basically flat even. Um, it's been on a slow decline since you know, the 80s, um, and that decline didn't really change much. So all, all we really see from banning guns is um, people pick up knives and kill each other because it, it's mostly gang crime, and it's probably the same in Australia. It's mostly, you know, the dealers on the streets or whoever um, well they can't get newsy now well I'm going to go pick up a knife and stab the guy to rob him 
He, and the thing is... in our major cities so you know just because a lot of guns you know aren't legal doesn't mean there aren't guns right and the, the just, you know, oh, sorry. overall i'm just looking at you know yeah gun crime goes down and the left uses this one a lot is we see a decrease in gun crime but I, personally i don't think it's any better to be murdered by a knife than a gun um so if yeah i would rather a gun change, yeah that's the difference here uh, I'd honestly rather be killed by a gun because it's probably yeah. quicker and less painful. Exactly, yeah. Um, so being stabbed to death sounds worse to me than being shot. And I was going to say that, um, you know, we have these statistics um, that show gun violence and, it, and the left the left is sort of exaggerating those statistics. So, for example, a large portion of those statistics are, for example, suicides. Um, and the thing is, well, when they banned guns, the amount of suicides don't associate themselves with guns increased. Um, so it feels like the left is, well, it, well it's not, it doesn't feel like, the left is actually um, sort of exaggerating the, the statistics to fit their agenda. Right, yeah, they, they twist their words, and it, it works pretty well. I mean, it does, yeah. In Australia, it does. Every time that someone gets shot, they talk about assault weapons. Well, what's an assault weapon? Yeah. It's weapon. It's, uh, yeah. it's an adjective for big, scary, black gun. <laughs> and if you look at the legal definition of assault weapon, it's effectively that. You, know, uh, you can put attachments on there, or you can put a scope on it, or, you know, um, it has a magazine that holds over X number of rounds. Like, yes, but none of these things make the gun inherently more dangerous. It's all cosmetic features. Uh, we interviewed last week uh, one of um, the Australian advocates for, for firearms, and here we asked him that question about assault weapons, and he's like, yeah, there's no such thing as an assault weapon. It's just a uh, loaded terminology. Right. Yeah, they, they try to associate because you think assault weapon, well, that's got to be an assault rifle, right? Yeah. Um, but it's not. You know, an assault rifle is actually well-defined. It's a weapon that fires um, uh, semi and fully automatic, or at least has variable fire between semi and fully, um, whereas an assault weapon is usually a semi-automatic weapon and then it has a bunch of cosmetic features. Uh, in Australia, sadly, uh, gun control is a, is a bipartisan policy, so even you know, our you know, conservative party supports um, strict gun control, so it's, it's very lonely being um, pro-gun in Australia. Yeah, it's, I, I think it's too late. It's one of those things, once you lose it, you never get it back. It's like a tax increase. If you vote to increase your taxes, um, even temporarily, they're never going to come back down. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good point, I think. Um, because, you know, we had our prime minister, for example, trying to in decrease taxes, but it was really hard for him to do that because everyone was like, oh, MG, he's going to um, decrease taxes for the rich. And, you know, it's he's trying to appeal to the rich and he's sort of ignoring the poor people. You know, there was that rhetoric, so it was really hard to reduce them. Right, right. What's going to happen to my schools and my roads? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, ro uh, the, ads, the roads will be in shambles and the highways will fall apart. <laughs> and uh, we'll talk a bit about uh, yeah, poverty in America now. Now, you've stated in your videos that you don't um, support uh, Obamacare, which is you know, every, everyone in Australia thinks that, oh, you know, before Obamacare, like, oh, sick people couldn't get... Uh, uh, me medical care at all. Uh, what, what's the real story? Um, to an extent, that's the case. Um, the sick had a lot of trouble getting um, insurance, um, which would make their health care costs go up. And uh, I think the best solution for them, or for that, is to um, allow uh, Medicare and Medicaid to cover them, which, for the most part, if you're significantly disabled, um, they already do. Um, but expand that to cover people with pre-existing conditions. But what they did instead is they uh, forced private insurance to cover people with pre-existing conditions. So a system that's designed to um, take care of mostly healthy people and therefore make money off them to pay for the people when they do get sick um, is now being forced to pay for sick people who have never actually um, put in a net benefit to the insurance company. And so it's just kind of being foisted onto everybody else to pay for them. Whereas Medicare oh, yeah. and Medicaid can get away with paying, you know, 
ridiculously low amounts of money for things. Insurance can't do that. Yeah. I just have one last question um, it, regarding similar regarding capitalism um, because you know how people think America has too much capitalism. The thing is um, people don't know that Australia actually has a freer economy than America um, and you know America doesn't America doesn't really have proper capitalism anymore does it? No, it, it's cronyism. Here. Exactly, um, yeah. You actually see that with a lot of these things. Is, um, the only thing that makes us at all more capitalist than the rest of the world is our relatively um, low taxes. But like, you look at Sweden, Norway, Denmark, you know, these socialist utopias Sanders is talking about. <laughs> Honestly, they're as free market, if not more, than we are. Yeah. Have. The only difference is they have insane taxes and we don't. Yeah, exactly. Other than that, they're more free market. You know, they have uh, less and more efficient regulation than we do. Um, they're more pro small business instead of, uh, you know, uh, we're going to hand out multi billion dollar contracts to Boeing to build a stealth fighter that isn't stealthy and can't fight. It's actually Lockheed Martin, but either way. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's the cronyism that's in America. That's, that's a problem as well. But the thing is, people are, again, twisting it um, around to sort of fit their rhetoric. But we have to stop there, and that, that concludes our episode. Um, thank you so much for, for being here. And thank you um, for our listeners for listening today. And this show is now available on iTunes, Stitcher, um, you know, if you want to listen to us on the go in your car. Um, it's on YouTube as well. Um, yep. And don't forget to te- check out uh, the Priority Pod uh, YouTube uh, channel as well, which we'll put uh, on, the, on the show notes page. Yeah, we will put the link um, on, on our page. Um, thanks again. Um, we'll, back, we'll be back next Tuesday with um, one of our, our normal um, shows, review shows, um, and another. we hope to bring another interview show next Thursday. Um, but thanks for listening. Thank you, um, Joe. Um, thanks, Priority Pod, and goodbye for now.